Amen. Two of my favorite words are glory, hallelujah. Do you feel that way today? If so, can you say them? Glory, Glory, hallelujah. hallelujah. Isn't it a wonderful thing to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ? And I come here today with great thanksgiving in my heart to be a part of the United Methodist Church and a part of the North Georgia Conference and a part of this great church, Dunwoody United Methodist Church. And it's good to see each one of you here this day. I'm very aware of the time, and I know that you are aware of the time. And I want you to know that I'm going to do my best to talk fast and to say something, at least anyway, okay? I want to read a passage of Scripture from John's Gospel, the 14th chapter. This is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible, and I I truly love John's Gospel. John's Gospel is a little different from the other Gospels, from the synoptic Gospels. Listen to these words from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. I'm going to read the 6th verse, uh, and then I'm going to read down uh, the 12th through the 14th verses. So hear this from the Common English Bible. Uh, the newest English translation of the Bible. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even, listen to this, this is Jesus. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father can be glorified in the Son. When you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The first thing I want to say today is a word of deep appreciation for this congregation. Hear me now. You are a great group. You are just a wonderful congregation. You are people whose hearts overflow in generosity and love. You have been gracious to Margaret and to me since the very first days we came into this conference, and that's been seven years ago. We held here in this sanctuary the the installation service. Some of you may have been here when I was installed as the bishop of this particular uh, Episcopal area. And you allowed us to do that here. Throughout the years that I've been in North Georgia, I have watched this congregation respond time and time again to the call of Christ upon you. And I commend you for that. So I want you to hear me say, I believe that you are an exemplary congregation. Now sometimes uh, you feel like, well, he's just saying that because he's here. No, I'm not just saying that because I'm here. I say it everywhere I go. (laughs) But here, I want you to know, I often point to Dunwoody United Methodist Church as the exemplary church, as the church that comes and ministers to one another in a pastoral way, but also ministers through the district and through the conference and throughout all the world, and you have seen examples of that already this very day with the family concerns you have here in this community and in this larger community and with your desire to to eradicate malaria. How many people in this congregation, raise your hand if you've had malaria. Look around the room. I don't see a hand. What does that tell you? It is possible to eradicate malaria. In this country, it has almost been eradicated. We rarely hear of anyone having malaria. Once I was in Uganda and I asked that question of a large group and virtually every hand in the room was raised. But we imagine no malaria. 
And we are now joining hands to help everyone in the world be able to be like this congregation. We are imagining no malaria anywhere. And you are doing your part. And I, I thank you for that. And there are people you will never meet who will be blessed because of you. That is the kind of exemplar you are in not only this conference, but all over the world. Oh, I commend you. I want you to know that. Keep on keeping on. Keep on being the church you have grown to be. I also want to thank you for the exemplary way you have made a significant transition in from a long-time beloved pastoral family here to receiving a new senior pastor. Oh, Wiley and Linda Stevens are dear to our hearts, aren't they? We have been blessed. This congregation has been blessed. And for, for years upon years upon years, they served here and led here and, and developed a wonderful staff, and we are grateful for that. And it's always difficult to make that transition. But I want you to know, I'm the person that appointed Dan Brown here. Amen. I, I will take full credit for that. <laughs> Dan and Carol Brown love you. And you have loved them. And a new relationship has been birthed. And you are working together with this entire wonderful staff to, consent, to continue to serve Christ in the finest way. And I commend you for that. That is not always easy. And you have done it. And you are doing it because you love Jesus Christ and you love the church. So I want to commend you for the way you've made this transition. I also want to say to you, the future for this church is bright. You've heard already that a group met this past weekend on Friday and Saturday to look at the future. Where is this church going? And I want you to know, I believe that the providence of God led the committee of 100, is that what you call that? The committee of 100 and this congregation to do exactly what this text says. This text, Jesus said, is that Jesus is the truth and the way and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. And Jesus says, I assure you that whoever believes in me and seeks to follow me will do what I have done. And did you hear it? Greater things than these. Because Jesus says, Jesus is going to continue to be with us. And the power of the Holy Spirit is going to continue to work through us. And we're going to do more and more and more, and I believe that's the direction of this congregation. And I believe that this committee of 100 and this congregation has seen, what do we want to be in the future? We want to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. We want to follow Jesus Christ in the way. We want to follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We want to tell the whole world the story of the good news of God. We want to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And we want to do it in the way God wants us to do it. Now our time is, is almost gone. But I've got to tell you two things. Two little stories. Two little illustrations. Exa Grubb gave me today a real surprise. My hometown is Dothan, Alabama. And there are people in this church that are from Dothan, Alabama. And there are people that know Dothan, Alabama. Exa Grubb gave me this picture. This picture today she gave to me, gave to Margaret and gave to me. This is the picture of my elementary school principal. <laughs> Exa Grubb's aunt. aunt. Exa Grubb's mother's sister. Now, <laughs> I'm going to share this with you. You don't have to tell everybody in the world this, but, but my principal and I in elementary school became very close. Her name was Fannie Mae Falk. And she became familiar with, can I say it here? 
with my fanny. <laughs> she had a little polo paddle that she would sometimes apply in a, in a directive way. <laughs> I'll never forget Fannie Mae Falk because she loved me. And she brought me along through six grades of school. Margaret, too. Margaret didn't get to know her as well as I did. <laughs> but I'm largely who I am, at least the good part of that, because somebody cared enough to pay close attention to me <laughs> and to guide me in a better way. That's what we're called upon to do. I have no doubt that Miss Falk was a Christian woman. And she was a Christian woman who saw in children possibilities. And she nurtured them day after day after day after day. Some people use all kinds of things to nurture us. But the finest way is to point us to Jesus. And X a grub is part of that family so you know the direction that family set, don't you? I want to tell you another little story of how to live our lives in ways that we sometimes can't uh, fully know. Uh, many, many years ago in Philadelphia, a man and his wife went to a little third-class hotel, and there was a, a big event in the, in the town, and and there was not a hotel room available in that little third-class hotel. And they had gotten to that hotel because they'd gone to hotel after hotel after hotel, and they didn't know that there was this uh, uh, event taking place and that they couldn't find a room. And so they went up to the night clerk of this hotel, and the man pleadingly said to him, Mr., please don't tell us that you don't have a room. My wife and I have been all over this city looking for a place to stay. We didn't know about all that was going on here. The hotels at which we usually stay are full. We're dead tired. It's after midnight. Please don't tell us that you don't have a place for us to sleep. We're, we're just exhausted. Now, this particular night clerk was one who believed in kindness in following the better way and so after a long moment's hesitation and struggling in his own mind he said well I'm sorry to tell you we we don't have a single room here either except my room I work at night and I sleep in the daytime now my room is not nearly as nice as even the other rooms in this hotel but it's clean and and you need a place to sleep, and so you just be my guests for the night. The next morning, at the breakfast table, the couple went to the waiter. When the waiter came over, the couple said, can, can we speak to the night clerk? They wanted to see him on very important business. The night clerk went in, and he recognized the two people from the night before, and he asked them how they had had their night, and they told him that they had had a good night's sleep, and they thanked him most sincerely. And then the husband astounded the night clerk with this statement. He said... Sir, you are too fine a hotel man to stay in a hotel like this. How would you like for me to build in the city of New York a big new luxury hotel and make you the manager of it? Well, you can imagine that night clerk supplies and he didn't know what to say. He kind of stammered and finally he said, well, that sounds like a, a truly wonderful idea. And then the guest introduced himself. My name is John Jacob Astor. At that time, Mr. Astor, who later died in the Titanic, was the wealthiest human being on earth. And so the Waldorf Astoria Hotel was built. And that night clerk, George C. Bolt, became in the years to follow the best known hotel man in the world. And a long number of years ago, Margaret and I took our two children when they were small and we went to New York and we went in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel and I had my picture made beside the picture that's standing there uh, that's always in that hotel of George C. Bolt, who was the original 
uh, operator of the Waldorf, Host Hot Waldorf Astoria Hotel from its beginning in March of 1893 until 1916. And we still recognize that name today. Why? Because a person believed in kindness and goodness and trusted that in doing what God would lay on our hearts to do, that the future is bright and good. And I believe that's what this congregation believes, that if we follow Jesus Christ, if we seek to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we will live it out where we are, we will tell the story to the whole world, and we will make disciples of Jesus Christ and others will come to have glorious experiences because God will make it so. Dearly beloved, Church of Jesus Christ, thank you for who you are. Do not underestimate God's call upon you and just live into it now and in the future and be the church God is calling you to be because Jesus has gone to be with the Father and Jesus is working with the Father on your behalf. Continue to join with Him and you'll see great things done, even greater things than you can imagine. Dear God, let it be. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for their faithful love. I thank you for their desire to serve you here and all around the world. And I pray that you would continue to inspire us. Oh, Lord, let us be your church. Let us do that which you have called upon us to do and help us to ask in the name of Jesus so that you may be glorified through what we do and that your will may be done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What a glorious day this has already been as we have gathered and as we have worshiped God and as we have seen testimonies of God's goodness and grace. Aren't you glad you're in a congregation like this amidst a church like this celebrating God together? Well, two of my favorite words are glory hallelujah. If you feel that way, can you say them? Glory hallelujah. glory hallelujah. Oh, what a joy it is for me to be a part of the United Methodist Church and to be a part of the North Georgia Conference of the United Methodist Church and to be a part of this wonderful district and to be a part of you as the people of Dunwoody United Methodist Church. I want you to know you are a great group. Turn to your neighbor and look at them and say, you're a great part of this group. <laughs> now, I want you to say that like you mean it because it is true. And I come to share that with you and you might say, well, he just says that everywhere he goes. Well, I, I do say that a lot of places I go, <laughs> but, but I often say it and point to Dunwoody United Methodist Church for who you are, doing things like you've already testified to doing today. And so I, I come to do, I, I'm aware of the time. I know our time is short right here, but, uh, but I do, I do want to say a few things to you. And uh, so give me just a, a moment here. But I thank you, sincerely thank you for being who you are. In that spirit, I want to read a passage of scripture from John's gospel. I'm going to read from the 14th chapter of John's gospel, which is one of my favorite uh, chapters in all of the Bible from one of my favorite Gospels. The Gospel of John is, is different from the other three. There's a, a flavor to it that's a little different from the other three that are called synoptic Gospels. But I invite you to listen to the reading of the Gospel of John, the, the 14th chapter. I'm going to read the 6th verse, and then I'm going to read the 12th through the 14th verses. Listen closely to this reading of God's Holy Word. Jesus answered, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then to the 12th verse. 
I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask for in my name so that the Father can be glorified in the Son. When you ask for anything in my name, I will do it. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I'm going to try to encapsulate what I had to say here in just a few brief words to you because we've had a wonderful service and, and we're celebrating uh, so many good things in the life of this church. I first of all do want to commend you for being the congregation that you are. When I come to be a part of this congregation, my spirit is lifted and I hope your spirit is lifted too. This congregation have blessed Margaret and me. You've blessed us in so many ways. If you may remember seven years ago when I was installed in this office, in this, in this wonderful annual conference, it took place here in the sanctuary of Dunwoody United Methodist Church. And so from the very earliest days here, you have blessed us. And you are, you are making a difference in this district, in, in, this, in this community, in this district, throughout this annual conference in the state and all around the world. You are making a difference You've heard some of that testified to today, but you continue to make a difference. And I want to encourage you. I want to thank you. I want to ask you to continue to be the church God is calling you to be. You have had a wonderful time together with a, a large body of this church looking to the future, planning for the future, trying to decide where God would have you go. And I believe this passage of Scripture is one of the passages that has led this congregation. I believe this congregation and the Committee of 100 have found that the way forward is the way that follows Jesus. Where is Jesus calling this church? And you are being called to follow that way. For Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. I commend you for who you are and for what you are. And I encourage you to continue in that way. I also want to thank you in these brief moments for uh, making a wonderful and sometimes difficult transition. For this congregation has gone through a transition period in recent days where a beloved senior pastor, Wiley Stevens and his wife Linda, who labored among you so generously and so wonderfully for so long and are so beloved in this congregation, have moved into the retired status in their ministry. And you, as the congregation you are, have assisted them in that and have made the transition to welcome a new senior pastor and a pastoral family. And you have welcomed Dan and Carol Brown in a wonderful way. And I want you to know, I will take full credit. <laughs> I appointed Dan Brown here to this church. And I know that you know this is a wonderful opportunity for this congregation to move forward into a new day and to move forward together. You have a wonderful couple with you, Dan and Carol. They are blessings and you are blessings. They love you and you love them. And I thank you for opening your hearts to the ministry of the Browns and to their ministry with you. You are blessed and they are blessed and it is a, an exciting time in the life of this church. So, how will you go forward now? Being who you are, knowing God is calling you with a wonderful pastoral staff. I, I just have to tell you how much I love this, this clergy staff and the lay staff and the volunteer staff of this congregation. We count on you, we need you, and we believe that God is using you. Uh, the staff of this church is, is a little bit remarkable in that I have a, some relationship with some of them that some of you may know and some of you may not. 
I remember the day Lane Davis was born. <laughs> His mother and father were dear friends of ours. His father died in a tragic loss of life through illness, and I still grieve the loss of Larry Davis as my friend and his mother, Leslie, so dear to me. And I remember when he was born, and I want to tell you something. From the time he came into this earth, he was a little bit remarkable. We would go and visit them. He was two and three years old, and you could have a conversation with Lane as if there were another adult, adult in the room. He had a specialness about him, and God has called him, and now he's serving you here, and his ministry will continue to serve. I love him. I love his mother and father, and I'm grateful to you for being in ministry with him. And then, lo and behold, when Margaret and I got here today, Exa Grubb came up to Margaret and and said, I want you to have this picture. And so she, she gave us a picture. She gave us a picture of our elementary school principal. We are from Dothan, Alabama. There are other people in this congregation that are from Dothan, Alabama. And Exa Grubb gave us a picture of Fannie Mae Falk, our elementary school principal, her aunt her mother's sister. And I want you to know Fannie Mae Falk was significant in my life. She and I got to be very close. <laughs> there, were, there were numerous occasions in my childhood when her very unusual name, Fannie Mae Falk, she grew to know the part of my anatomy that sounds a lot like that. <laughs> because she had a little polo paddle that she would apply in an educational way. I don't believe Margaret ever got to know Miss Falk like I got to know Miss Falk. But she was a woman of faith. She was committed to children like these children that come here. She was committed to their education. She could never have imagined that they called me Mickey when I was little, that Mickey Watson would one day be Exa's bishop in the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, that would probably have troubled her, uh, Exa. <laughs> but you see, you can't tell how life unfolds, can you? How many of you, I want you to raise your hand, if you've ever had malaria. Raise your hand if you've ever had malaria. All right, now I'm looking carefully. I don't see a single hand. Do you know what that means? That means a malaria can be eradicated. It has virtually been eradicated in this country, hasn't it? We hardly know anyone who has had malaria. I've been in Uganda and ask a large group of people that very question. How many of you have had malaria? And virtually, if not completely, every person in the room raised their hand. Pregnant women, the elderly, and children can be devastated and killed by malaria. Today, in answer to God's call upon this church's life, you are making an effort to cause the whole world to be like we are in this room. We are imagining no more malaria. And we're seeking to do in the name of Christ that which would enable that terrible disease, especially for the young or the elderly or the help, uh, people who are vulnerable with their help to eradicate that problem from their lives. Why are we doing that? Because this scripture tells us, did you catch this? Jesus said, I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and they will do even greater works than these. Did you hear that? Jesus said, 
that the followers of Jesus, if we see Him as the way and the truth and the life, and if we go to Him, are enabled, empowered by God's grace to do greater things than they even saw Jesus doing. Now, if that is not an awesome scripture to you, I don't know where one is. For Christ is calling this congregation to be followers of Jesus Christ, to trust in Jesus Christ, to do that which Jesus Christ has gone to the Father to assist us in doing. That's who we are called to be. That is what this church is to do in the future. If you are looking for what the next 10 years of this church ought to be, here it is to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord, to follow in the ways of Jesus Christ and to allow Jesus Christ to work within us and through us through the power of the Holy Spirit to do all these glorious and good things so that Jesus may be glorified and that all the world may know because we've got a story to tell to the nations, a story of truth and light, a story of goodness and power and grace. And you're the ones to tell it. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. You're the one to tell it. (laughs) That's who we're called to be as the church. That's what we're called to do. And Jesus is with the Father. And whatever we ask in the spirit of Jesus and whatever we ask in the name of Jesus, this text says, when you ask me for anything in my name, Did you hear this? Jesus said, I will do it. Oh, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. I know our time is up, but I'm going to tell you one story. I've just got to tell you one story. And it tells you how if you do what God calls you to do, what a difference it can make that you can't see. I I had no idea when when this little baby was born. I I remember when he was born. I didn't know what would happen to him. Lo and behold, we're we're here together in a remarkable way today. I couldn't couldn't see that. Exa Grubb, she had no idea that her aunt was the principal of a little troublemaking boy that would one day be in a setting like this. She couldn't see that. Years ago, many, many, many years ago in Philadelphia, a man and his wife went into a little third-class hotel. Uh, There was a big event in that town, and there was a lot of activity. And so this man and his wife went up to the night clerk in that hotel, and the husband said pleadingly, very late into the evening, Mr., please, please don't tell us that you don't have a room in this hotel. My wife and I have been all over the city looking for a place to stay, and everywhere we go, they, they, they don't have a place. We didn't know that there was this, all this big event taking place here in Philadelphia, and the hotels at which we usually stay are all full, and, and we're absolutely exhausted. We're dead tired, and it's after midnight. Please don't, don't tell us that you don't have a place for us to sleep. That one night clerk was a person who was a man of faith, And he believed in kindness. He looked at the couple for a long moment and then he answered them, Well, I don't have a room here in the hotel. Except I'm the night clerk. I work at night. I've got a room here. I sleep in the daytime. My room's not as nice as the other rooms, but it is clean and I'll be happy for you to be my guest for tonight. The next morning at the breakfast table, the couple sent the waiter to tell the night clerk that they wanted to see him on very important business. The night clerk went in and recognized the two people, sat down at the table and said he hoped they'd had a good night's sleep. They told him that they had and that they were deeply appreciative for the use of his room. And then the husband of the couple astounded the night clerk with this statement. He said, Sir... You are too fine a hotel man to stay in a hotel like this. How would you like for me to build in the city of New York a new big luxury hotel and make you the manager of it? Well, of course, the night clerk didn't know what to say, and he finally stammered stammered out, well, that, that certainly sounds like a wonderful idea. 
It was then that his guest introduced himself. He said, I am John Jacob Astor, the man who was later killed in the Titanic, but at the time was the wealthiest human being on earth. And so, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel was built in New York City, and that night clerk, George C. Bolt, became in the years to follow the best-known hotel man in the world. He served as the operator of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, the original one, from its opening in March of 1893 until 1916. And when Margaret and I and our two children went there some years ago, we saw his picture hanging there in the current Waldorf Astoria, and I've got a picture of me standing beside George C. Bolt and my wife and children. George Bolt could not have known what following the kindness and the example of Jesus would mean in his life nor in the world. He could not have known. But he did what he could do where he was. That is precisely what we are all called to do. That is precisely who Dunwoody Church is called to be. To join hands with the wonderful pastoral staff and the lay staff and the volunteers of this congregation. To join hands with the district and with the conference and with Christians all over the world and follow Jesus because Jesus is with the Father pleading for us. Dearly beloved, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you have done. And may God grant you the good sense to continue to do that which God called you to do so that you may tell the story of God's goodness and God's grace all over the world and that disciples may be made so that Jesus can work with us and do greater things than we can even think or imagine. Dear God, let it be. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I ask that you would continue to be with this wonderful church. I ask that you would continue to work in them and through them, that this congregation may be all that you are calling it to be. Oh Lord, we thank you for all that has been and we ask in the days ahead that you would open our eyes to see all that you would have us be and do and give us strength through the power of your Holy Spirit to do it to the honor and glory of your holy name. In the name of Christ we ask it. Amen. And I do want to take a moment and just say thank you to Doug and 